You are live. Hey everybody, good morning. It is a beautiful day here at Hearst Castle. My name is Tracy and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Mike. We've got a great program in store for you. Uh, Castle to Coast Kids, we're a junior ranger program uh, going out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays from uh, different parks here uh, on California's Central Coast and what is called the San Luis Obispo uh coastal district and today we're broadcasting from Hearst castle there we see the house and then we're going to be going to a second location actually there's even a third location so we've got a lot in store for you today i got a picture in the mail um really happy to see the castle kids out there drawing their picture of Hearst castle sending it to us via social media, Facebook and Instagram, and even mailing it. So we've got this picture right here from Jim L. in uh, Indiana. He drew a picture of the castle. He did this great job. He captured the palm tree. He captured uh, the brick of uh, the stone facade on the castle. Let's see, how did he get those towers? Very well, he drew in and colored the Spanish tiles. He even got the teakwood cornice. He got all four floors of Hearst Castle. What do y'all say? And Jim must have known about the zoo that William Randolph Hearst once had and the giraffes because he drew this really cool long necked giraffe type person. He called it Ramona. Now, if you want to be a castle kid and you want to draw us your picture of Hearst Castle, there's a couple ways that you can do it. You can post it to social media. If you have a family member, a caregiver, a parent who has a, an account, uh, tag Hearst Castle. You can even hashtag Castle to Coast Kids um, and Instagram as well. You can even mail it to us like Jim in Indiana did. He looked up our address online. He put attention, oh, Tracy on the uh, piece of mail and he sent it right here to Hearst Castle. Now this is the former home, well, let me put this over here. This is the former home of William Randolph Hearst. He was a famous Californian a uh, hundred years ago, very wealthy, well known. He was known for his newspaper publishing company. So he had newspapers, magazines. What else did he have, Mike Davis? He had, he had a movie production company. Uh, today, you might, uh, did you know that the family has a percentage of ESPN and A&E? So they're still in that media realm today. Yeah, so the man who built this house, William Randolph Hearst, he had a publishing business, a media company, and it's actually still going today. However, this is owned by California State Parks now. There we go. We got the bears since 1864. And it overlooks his family's ranch. Here's the Hearst Ranch. Now, later on in our program, we will be connecting with San Simeon Cove. Monica's down there at the William R. Hearst Memorial State Beach. And we're going to be connecting with her and understanding how that cove, that San Simeon Deepwater Cove, has its connections to Hearst Castle. Now Hearst Castle right here, it wouldn't be here. Uh, by the way, we're celebrating 100 years this year uh, and we're very excited about that. It's a special year for us. Even though it's a crazy year, as you know, we're both wearing our masks uh, because of the pandemic and Hearst Castle has been closed for several months to the public, but usually this whole area would be filled. We have over half a million people that visit this state park a year on a typical year. Now, 
Hearst Castle was started about a hundred years ago. William Randolph Hearst built it on his family's ranch, but it wouldn't be here if his father didn't first buy the ranch in 1865, or at least start buying some of the ranch land. I'll get you a picture of George, because we're going to talk about George here and there throughout the program, the father of the media mogul, the newspaper man. Uh, George was actually a miner, and he came out west in search of gold in the 1850s. Uh, he did make it rich, uh, and it was with silver. So he has quite a history and legacy. And he bought this ranch land here on California's central coast. We're somewhere between San Francisco and Los Angeles. But this, this land has had such a unique history for thousands of years before the Hearst family owned it. So I'm just gonna give a little pan of what we are looking at. It's like I said, Mike, it is a beautiful day on the Pacific Ocean, wouldn't you say? It is gorgeous today. So we're looking north. If you just took Highway 1 to San Francisco on that road, you'd probably get there in about four hours. And then we'll pan across. So there's Monica. Hi, Monica. We'll be talking to you very shortly at that cove. Now we're pretty remote here. Uh, the closest grocery store is about 30 minutes away. The closest hospital is probably like an hour in San Luis Obispo. So we're looking all the way down there, Morro Bay and onward to Los Angeles about four hours later if you were in a car on Highway 1. So for thousands of years, this land was inhabited uh, by native tribes, the Chumash and the Salinan. Uh, the ocean is bountiful with shellfish, uh, fishing. The land has these native coastal live oak trees where the native tribes would use the acorns and uh, use them for their meals. And then the Spanish would come in the 1700s and start putting missions and dotting them, building missions and ranches all up and down the coast. And Mexico would later own this part of California. But what we're gonna focus on is the time period in the 1800s when the San Simeon Cove was a bustling port. And I've got Mike Davis here with me. Here's here to help us understand this connection between Hearst Castle, between the port, uh, San Simeon Cove, and what was going on there in the 1800s before this was even built. The actual, the town of San Simeon was founded in 1836. And the harbor is a natural deep water port. And like Tracy mentioned, the Native Americans would, would harvest uh, shellfish and fishing and things like that. They also harvested kelp. And that, that, that was a, also a, a great item for food for them as well. And the town founded 1836. And Mr. Hearst's father, George Hearst, purchased a lot of the property around here in 1865. At one point, he had about 250,000 acres. And if you look down at the, at the pier down below, you see it way down there? That first pier was put in around 1957. And the point that you see way over here used to not have trees on it. George Hurst, Mr. Hurst's father, planted those trees around 1890. And he was doing that as a like a windbreak, something like that, for uh, and also to for wood and things like that for construction. So what we're gonna do in just a moment is we're gonna bring you down there to the uh, San Simeon Cove to get a better look. Um, as you can see, we are, what would you say, about five miles? We're is about the five crow, miles. Five yeah. miles is the crow flies from here at Hearst Castle, which is 1,600 feet above sea level, 
overlooking the San Simeon Cove. There's a lot of really interesting connections. The history dates back to the 1800s and Monica is gonna go over some of that history during that time period uh, that's filled with um, boats coming into that cove. She's gonna talk about whales and even there was a whaling industry yes, back then and talk about what people use uh, whales for. So let's see here, let's flip it around. Let's zoom in. Let's see how far we can get it. Uh, well, we can actually see an airstrip, uh, let's see, right over here. That was built by William Randolph Hearst in the uh, 1900s later on. And if anybody's ever taken a tour of Hearst Castle, you've been to that visitor center right out there. Kind of see that white building right in the center. And we can actually see the, uh, the pier right about there. You can see the beer. That's not the original pier. And the cove that Mike was talking about, or actually the point. You can see how it points out into the water filled with uh, eucalyptus trees, non-native. So the, the eucalyptus weren't here when the native tribes, the Chumash and the Salinan were here. Uh, so those were planted a little later. And when, when we come back to Hearst Castle in about 15, 20 minutes, we're gonna be coming to you That's from the fourth floor. So Monica, we can't wait to uh, talk to you and see you soon. Take it away. Awesome. Hi everyone. My name is Monica and I'm down here at the pier. Thank you for joining today for Co uh, Castle to Coast Kids for our virtual junior ranger program. I'm an interpreter for California State Parks and uh, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about the pier here and San Simeon Cove or San Simeon Bay, which is what Tracy and Mike were just showing you. And in fact, let me flip around the camera and I'm gonna show you where they are. So I'm looking up at the hilltop here and the castle is right about there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and zoom in. There we go. Maybe you can see some of those buildings up on top of the hill. And if you squint really closely, maybe you can see Tracy and Mike. We'll We're waving at you, Monica. We're waving. <laughs> hey, everyone. All right. Awesome. So uh, like they mentioned, we are about five miles away from each other. Uh, and I'm down along the Pacific Ocean, the central coast of California. And San Simeon Cove, uh, also known as San Simeon Bay, is part of Hearst San Simeon State Park, uh, which is a California state park, just like Hearst Castle. And this park encompasses a lot of the coastline, encompasses this beautiful area of the beach. And uh, San Simeon Bay uh, is just a little pocket of the ocean that is surrounded by land on a lot of its sides. That's what a bay is, right? So if we check out here, there's San Simeon Point with all the eucalyptus trees that Mike and Tracy mentioned before. That's one side of the bay. And then if we look all over to uh, the southern end there, we've got the land coming out right there for the southern end of the bay. So this is a really awesome, beautiful area. It's a beautiful, sunny day today. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how significant this area is. Mike and Tracy mentioned there's a lot of really awesome, rich history here, uh, here at San Simeon Bay or San Simeon Cove. And before we start, I'm just gonna look around for a second. Okay, no one's nearby. I'm gonna give you a quick smile. Hi, everyone. I do have my mask on because I am in a public space and people can access these areas, but I took it off for a second because the coast was clear. Uh, but okay, so this uh, area, San Simeon Bay, uh, like Mike and Tracy mentioned, used to be a whaling station. A whaling station. Now, what does that mean, whaling? 
Does that mean whale watching? No, that actually means whale hunting. Yes, believe it or not, back in the 1800s, around the 1860s, people used to hunt whales. And that was really popular right here at San Simeon Bay. People used to hunt whales uh, and they would capture them and then they, they would use them for all sorts of different resources, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, now we don't do this anymore. We don't hunt whales anymore, but can you imagine that? Trying to hunt a whale? I can't even imagine that because we know how big whales are, right? That would be so difficult, right? So let me do a little uh, demonstration here. I'm gonna show you just how big some of these whales are that we might see. Uh, but first, let me ask you, what types of whales do you think we might be able to find along the coast of California? Hmm, because the whales we can see today are the same types of whales that we might have been able to see back then in the 1860s. So what are your guesses? What types of whales might be out here? Did I hear a humpback whale? Oh, a humpback whale. That might be a type of whale you might see. Let me show you a photo. A humpback whale, something like that. Or maybe even a blue whale. Did I hear someone say a blue whale? Oh my gosh, aren't blue whales the biggest animals to ever live on Earth? Yes. And believe it or not, if you're really, really lucky, you might be able to see a blue whale off the coast here. What are some other whales you might be able to see? Maybe something called a gray whale. A gray whale. And that is super popular or super common to see along the west coast here. A gray whale might look something like this. It's got those white spots on it. Those are all types of whales you might see here on the coast of California. You might also even be really lucky to see a, uh, an orca or a killer whale. But the two most common ones are definitely gonna be the humpback whale, the first one that we saw, and a gray whale, the one with the white spots. And those are the ones that were most commonly hunted back then in the whaling days. Now again, try to imagine what it must be like to hunt a whale that is way, way bigger than you and I. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna flip this camera around and I'm gonna try to demonstrate uh, just how big a whale is. So I'm gonna position this camera here on the end of the pier and we're gonna pretend like this spot right here is the whale's tail or its flukes. And I'm gonna walk out and I'm gonna measure how long a humpback whale is. So I'm gonna start walking. My, uh, my sound might cut out the further I go, but I'll just give you a wave when I'm a uh, at the length of a humpback whale. So I'm gonna walk out here. How long do you think this is? Wow. Hopefully my uh, sound has come back in now, but did you see how far away we were? That is the length of a humpback whale, which is about uh, 52 feet long, so just over 50 feet. Can you imagine trying to capture a whale that big that's out swimming in the ocean? It took a lot of hard work, lots of energy to do that. Now you'd probably think, well, they must have had a lot of men and really big boats uh, out in the ocean to be able to capture whales that big, right? Mm -mm. No, their boats were smaller than the whales, maybe about 30 feet long. So uh, a little bit bigger than half the size of a whale. And only about three or four men could fit on that boat at a time. So imagine that. There's only uh, three or four people trying to reel in, trying to capture a 60,000 pound animal. Wow, 
That's pretty incredible. That must be exhausting. So how would they do this? So let me flip this around. So we have uh, the beautiful San Simeon Bay here. And uh, like was mentioned before, uh, this pier wasn't here back then. There actually used to be a pier out there that led up to those buildings there. Uh, but back then, uh, when they were going to hunt whales, one person, a lookout, would be standing somewhere on San Simeon Point, probably at the tip there. And they would be scanning the ocean, looking for signs of whales. Now, what might you look for if you were trying to spot a whale in the ocean? What kinds of signs would you be looking for? Hmm, maybe you might see the flap of its tail or its fluke, that's what it's called. Maybe you might be looking for that. Or what's another way you can, uh, you know that there's a whale out there? Right, if you see uh, a spout-like thing from its blowhole, them breathing out uh, and you can see their breath in the form of condensed air or water. So they might be looking for the flip of a whale's tail or uh, the expulsion from their blowhole. And when that person out there on San Simeon Point would see a whale, whale ho! They'd let those other men know and those men would go out on their boat out to where the whale was. And this could be miles and miles from the coast, maybe five or six miles away. So imagine having to paddle their boat all the way out to where the whale is. They didn't have motors or engines on their boats back then, so it was all manpower, right? They'd paddle and paddle out to where the whale was. And then what happens when they get there? Well, they have to capture it, right? They have to capture the whale. How did they do this? Well, they would use something called a harpoon. Now, what's a harpoon? If you haven't heard of that before, I kind of like to think of it as a mixture between uh, a bone arrow and a gun. So you uh, would shoot out something that's kind of like a really sharp arrow, and you'd hope that it lands on the whale and it actually uh, would harm the whale, right? It would wound it, the animal becomes a lot slower, then they would reel it in. They'd try, uh, they'd try to capture it that way. But remember, these animals are 60,000 pounds. Do you think it's gonna be easy? No, they, it might take all day for them to try to wrestle with the whale, right? Because that whale's gonna try to get away. It might drag them 20 miles offshore just in that fight, right? They weren't always successful. But when they were, they would drag that whale uh, out to the co uh, up to the coast here, and uh, maybe along that old pier that was there, or on another area that was probably near the point called a wharf, where they would take the whale up there, uh, and then they would do something called flensing, which just means that they would uh, they would carve off pieces of its blubber right? So it's fat that's covering its body. It would carve off pieces of its blubber and use, uh, they would use that blubber to melt into oil. Uh, and I'll show you, I'm going to start walking over to uh, a, a uh, melting pot, a blubber melting pot that they actually would use back then. So while I walk over there, uh, I'm gonna show you something else. So not only would they use whales for their blubber to melt into oil, but they might use another part of the whale uh, for something else. And that part of the whale is something called baleen. And it looks like this. What do you think this is? What part of the whale did that come from? Huh. Imagine it like this. This is kind of like the whale's teeth. Now those gray whales and humpback whales, they don't have teeth like you and I do. They have this baleen. And you would see uh, 
lots and lots of pieces of this baleen kind of lined up next to each other, kind of like stacking plates. And this is what they would use to eat their food, how they filter their food. Because what do whales like that eat? You know it, krill. Awesome. And those krill are super, super tiny. So they would use this baleen uh, and these little fringes to filter through uh, the water and uh, capture those krill. But when people hunted them, they would use this baleen for all sorts of things because it's really hard. Uh, it would be similar to plastic. And if you wanna know just what this is made out of, go ahead and take your finger and tap on your fingernail. If you tap on your fingernail, uh, you'll notice it's hard, right? It's made out of something called keratin, which is the same stuff that this uh, baleen is made out of. All right, so I've made it to this whaling pot. So this is a giant, giant pot that they would uh, use. They would put the blubber in it. They would put the blubber in it and uh, they would melt it down into oil. And that oil could be used for all sorts of things, uh, mostly to light lamps, because back then electricity is super hard to come by. So they'd have to use lamps instead that were uh, fueled by whale oil. And one whale could get you gallons and gallons and gallons of oil. So it was a uh, very, uh, it was really easy to get a lot of use out of just one whale. All that hard work was worth it. When whaling was super popular here, they were capturing over 20 whales per year. Wow, 20 whales per year. Now, I want to remind you that this wasn't the only whaling station in California. In fact, there were over 20 stations all along the coast at that time. And all of those stations were capturing likely over 20 whales per year. Now, imagine that. That's hundreds of whales being hunted, being killed per year. So what do you think that does to the overall whale population? If they're all being hunted, doesn't that mean there's less and less whales? And that's exactly right. Here at San Simeon, whaling was really popular for the first uh, several years that it was uh, in business here. But over time, they weren't capturing as many whales. It was getting really hard to capture whales. Now, why do you think that is? Why might it become really hard to capture whales time? Well, for a couple different reasons. So, more whales that they killed, that just lessens the amount. Also, less whales. So that must mean that they were hunting.
Here we go. Sorry about that. I think I walked too far out on the pier. But whales are really smart, right? And over time, they realized that, hey, these boats aren't super friendly. So whales started learning and they didn't hang out as close to the coast as they did uh, before. So it's getting harder to hunt whales because there weren't as many of them. And, and they were way farther out than they used to be. So whaling eventually wasn't uh, as successful. And uh, eventually that whaling was shut down. And I'm gonna head it, I'm gonna bring it over uh, back at Castle to Mike and Tracy to tell us a little bit of uh, right over there. So I'm gonna send it back up to you, Tracy and Mike, at the top of the hill on the castle. Thanks everyone for, for joining me down the coast. We'll see you next time. All right, Monica, thank you so much. I'm waving at you. Monica's right down there, actually, right next to that uh, palm tree on the left side. And wow, the, what a great view we have. Uh, Monica, that was, whaling has, yeah, whaling has such an interesting history. In my personal opinion, I'm really glad that it doesn't happen anymore. And I'm fascinated that whales adapted uh, within their environment. They knew the dangers of their environment and they started to adapt their route in the ocean to move away from that cove. Um, so that was one way that uh, the decrease in whaling occurs in the 1800s. But there was another reason how whaling or why whaling got stopped at that cove that we've been learning about. And that was because Mr. Hearst's mother, Phoebe Hearst, she bought the property after her husband passed away and ended whaling. She just did not like it. And whaling really began to die out. Down at, the, down at the harbor down below, or the cove, they actually harvested over 300 whales during that time period. That was a lot of whales, and that really hurt the population of both the humpback and the gray whales, like Monica said. So... Phoebe's an interesting person. Now, in this house, Hearst Castle, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the parents, Phoebe. And um, let's see, we got a picture. Yeah, Phoebe there. Let's, let's show you who Phoebe is. She's a famous Californian as well. So Phoebe and George. I showed you George already. Here's Phoebe. She helped to uh, end whaling on San Simeon Cove because she bought the land and essentially, would you say put them out of business, Mike? Yes, I would say that. Uh, Phoebe's a famous Californian. She's a philanthropist. Uh, she she would uh, donate money and time to young children in education, women in the arts, women in education. Uh, and she was a lot like her son, an art collector. So art actually gets uh, brought into the picture here. So we see the cove, San Simeon Cove. Look at the view. Now this is a view that people, uh, especially visitors to the state park when we are open, they don't get to see this view. Mike, where are we right now? We are at one of the highest points. We're in between the two bell towers right now. And like Tracy said, guests really never get to see this. I myself imagine Mr. Hurst being up here instead of them harvesting whales, maybe up here whale watching. Do you think uh, William Randolph Hurst had some binoculars standing on his fourth floor looking over the Santa Lucia Mountains and the Pacific Ocean, uh, looking for whale spouts, I imagine. So we're at almost the highest point of the castle on the fourth floor. I'm just giving you a nice look and I'll check out. This is one of the bell towers. It's uh, It's 137 feet tall, actually, minus that weather vane. There's a total between the two towers of 36 uh, Carillon bells. Now, Mike, those bells most likely came in through the San Simeon Cove. Do you wanna uh, tell us about that? They probably did. Uh, what happened is you gotta think, construction began about a hundred years ago. So they didn't have airplanes and the only road here was a dirt road. 
So Mr. Hurst purchased these bells behind me. And like Tracy said, there's 18 in each tower. The smallest one's 10 pounds and the heaviest one weighs 1,600 pounds. But they were purchased in Europe, probably came over by ship to New York. And then they probably by rail came to the West Coast, went back down to the harbor by ship. And I know Monica mentioned that other pier down there. The other pier was a little bit bigger than the one she was standing at. That was built in 1878. And it was over a thousand feet in length. And it cost Mr. Hearst's father $20,000 to build that. And then from there, they would take the bells and the art and the construction. There's the pier right there that you can see. see? So, so Mike, this pier has tracks on it. That's right. What are they pushing on those tracks? What they would do is they would unload the cargo from the ship. They would put it on like real small rail cars. And then they would push them down the rails to some of those other buildings that you see, the building to the right and the buildings to the left. Those are warehouses. And they would offload, thank you, there you go. And they would offload the cargo into some of those warehouses. And sometimes it'd be everything from art to building materials to anything that would come in. And that's the, that's the, uh, the pier that William Randolph Hearst brought all his construction materials and all his art they offloaded it from the pier down below. And then they came, could have been by, I don't know, it could have been horse-drawn carriages or maybe real old trucks up that road, right that you see that Tracy's pointing at. That's about a five mile road. And that's a dirt road the whole time when construction was going on up here. And construction went on for 28 years. Absolutely amazing these people were able to do that. Not only to bring the art up, but I know when Tracy was panning to the right, did you see the palm trees? Even the palm trees were brought up by truck up that same road that we just pointed out to you. So later on, after the whaling industry, after uh, Mr. Hurst's parents would uh, pass away, he'd start building this house and he'd use Sam Simeon Cove to bring in all his treasures and his art and even the building materials of this uh, house that's 115 rooms. And a lot of it's coming in through the cove. It's yep. coming up that road that used to be dirt and it's landing right here. And we're talking everything. I'll show you the other tower. Everything that we see outside the, the palm trees, these palm trees are a little over a hundred years old. They were planted in the 1920s and they were already uh, almost, uh, they, they were a mature tree, semi-mature tree when they were put into the ground. So they were brought up with the root and all. Uh, let's see here. Here's the up opposite tower. Now there's bells in there. They ring every day at noon. I think somewhere on Hearst Castle Facebook page, we actually have a video of the bells ringing from up here. And we are on the fourth floor of Hearst Castle overlooking everything that he built. Colorful Spanish tiles. This is something that you can include in your drawing of Hearst Castle if you wanna be a castle kid and share us your artwork because artwork has a lot to do with Hearst Castle. Mr. Hearst was an art collector, which is why his, the, the house that he built is so ornate. There's so many interesting things to look at. Even these lions, these lions are great right here. There's several lions right on the front of the house. We can see a good outline. Now, don't worry, Mike and I are being very safe. Even though we're four floors up, there is a Spanish tile roof right below. That would actually be uh, hit the third floor and Mr. Hurst's bedroom over on uh, this side, almost his sitting room. And we can see the walkways and even the Neptune pool from here. That's really cool. We get like a little sliver of the Neptune pool. The Neptune pool, it, missed, it looks kind of small now. That is 104 feet long. And I don't know about you, but I love swimming, but I don't like being cold. 
So instead of swimming in the Pacific Ocean, I'm with Mr. Hurst. I'd come swimming up here because that pool was heated to about 75 degrees in Mr. Hurst's time. And the ocean's about 58 degrees. So that's pretty cold. That's quite a difference. Yeah. Well, we've had a really great time here today. Um, Mike, thank you for joining me. Thank My you pleasure. for talking to us about the history of San Simeon Cove. Anything else that you want to add? Well, I just want to thank everyone for, for listening. And I do want to see some drawings come up. And you could even do the castle or you could even do the bell towers if you want. So we do want to see some of those drawings. But thank you so much for joining. And I think I'm going to exit over behind here. All right. Let me flip it around so I can yeah. show everybody how you get in and out. We want to get a good, nice, long view. Yeah. Kind of reminds me, I wonder if we put a whale up here, if it could go from one bell tower to the other bell tower it or it, the whale would be actually even longer. <laughs> yeah. That was a fascinating fact, uh, Monica, about how long whales are. Well, Mike, thanks for joining Bye, me today. Say goodbye to Mike. Goodbye. Kind of a little door, everyone, huh? Coming down here. Down some stairs. And there we go. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Um, let me give you a little smile. There's no one else up here. It's safe for me to take off my mask. I'm outdoors. Um, I want to thank you for joining me. Thank you for sending me your art, for being a castle kid, and help and coming along to make that connection between the coast and William R. Hurst, uh, San Simeon uh, Memorial Beach and the castle right here. Lots of lots of history, interesting things going on here. When we reopen, I hope you'll join us for a tour. Uh, the Castle to Coast Kids Junior Ranger Program uh, for, for ages seven to 12, even though everyone can join, will be back on tomorrow at 10 a.m. and we'll be out there on the coast this time around. So we'll see you again, have a beautiful day, thanks. Bye everyone.